Welcome everyone. I'm Lillian Mills, Dean of the Texas Macomb School of Business. Thank you for joining us today for The Soul of Business, Leading with Impact and Entrepreneurial Mindset, a discussion with Brett Hurt on the future of work, corporate responsibility, and how your entrepreneurial traits can help navigate uncertain territory successfully. I'm so pleased to introduce my friend, Brett Hurt, since graduating from McCombs with a BBA in 1994, Brett has led multiple successful startups. He is currently the CEO and co-founder of Data.World, the enterprise data catalog for the modern data stack. Data.World is a certified B corporation and a public benefit corporation home to the world's largest collaborative open data community with more than 1.6 million members, including 90% of the Fortune 500. Brett also co-founded and led Bazaar Voice to become a unicorn as its CEO through its IPO, which was named one of the top five by the Wall Street Journal in 2012, its follow-on offering and two acquisitions. Brett also founded and led Core Metrics, which was rated the number one web analytics solution by Forrester Research, and like Bizarre Voice, expanded into a global company and leader. Core Metrics was acquired by IBM in 2010. In 2017, Brett was awarded the best CEO Legacy Award by Austin Business Journal. He is a Henry Crown Fellow, a Braddock Scholar at the Aspen Institute. Just recently, he is the author of The Entrepreneur's Essentials, which launched on Mother's Day. And we at McCombs featured Brett in our spring 2022 issue of McCombs Magazine. Welcome, Brett. Thank you so much, Dean. Well, it's always a pleasure. You're just such a great leader, and it's a real honor to be on here with you. Well, we're going to talk about a wide set of questions over the next half hour. We're saving about 10 minutes for some excellent pre-submitted questions. I'll keep my eye on the live Q&A during this webinar. And we've been, we're coming out of pandemic into living in post-pandemic world. And I thought we'd start right there, Brett, about challenges and benefits of being an entrepreneur right now and how that was three years ago, then the last two years. And once you talk about that, and then we'll talk about the current market turbulence separately. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I, I've been through a lot of downturns. Um, I was the CEO of Core Metrics during the dot-com bust, followed by 9-11. I was the CEO of Bizarre Voice going through the Great Recession, which almost turned into a Great Depression, mm -hmm. had it not been for some of the banks being bailed out and just all of the really, you know, kind of unprecedented things that happened during that time. And then we had the pandemic hit right. with data.world, and it was terrifying at first, um, both from a health perspective, because we had so little information about it. Mm -hmm. Bodies were being lined up in Italy and freezers. Um, you know, Wuhan was locked down. Right. Um, and everybody was terrified. And we saw that reaction in the stock market and with companies. And I thought this could be really, really bad. And Everybody was watching that movie Contagion. Believe it or not, that was the top 10 mm -hmm. in the top 10 movies on iTunes for about a four month period. Right. And so that was terrifying everybody because in that movie, I think it was something like 25% of people that got that disease died. Obviously, it was fictional. Um, so it was, it was uh it was really challenging to say the least. And and like you, I enjoy being in person with people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're human beings, we're physical beings, and we really like that tactile sensation of looking each other in the eyes and, right. you know, being able to work together. And we had to 
kind of, you know, power through it, you know, as, as you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And um, we learned how to work um, in a way where we bent the hospital curve to the greatest extent that we could. And we ultimately weathered through it by at data.world at least focusing on industries which were not so frozen that they stopped buying anything. Okay. And we helped our customers become incredibly data-driven during that challenging time. And that made them much more resilient. It made them frankly um, thrive. And we became the most deployed data tool of all time and quite a few of our customers. Um, one of the largest consultancies in the world has over two thirds of their people now using our platform, for example, and Great. that enabled them to really help their customers more. So I really felt like I got um, a bit of a PhD and leading through a crisis through that. And now we're entering into yet another crisis because of several factors. Um, one of them being that um, we've stimulated to the point and by yeah. we have the Fed um, and the government has stimulated to a point where it really made the economy run white hot. Um, and then we had fewer workers because people were coming back into the workforce that seized up a lot of the supply chain. Yep. Then a war broke out that is yes. still going on. You know, we tend to be short term minded sometimes in America and there's good and bad things about that. But the bad thing is that every hour right now, there are people dying in Ukraine because of that war. And, um, and we've just had, you know, kind of the perfect storm set up here for what will probably be a recession for the next, you know, year and a half, two years, who knows. And during that time, I will make the prediction right now, because I've seen this in, in the past, now through several cycles, that it'll be intensely clarifying for people data will become even more important because let's be honest, data is something that when you say it, people start to think about tapping the latest brainiac that they've seen and saying, hey, help me figure out what's going on here. A lot of people are intimidated by mathematics, for example. My grandfather taught mathematics at UT his entire career. Right. And the reality is that data is just the facts about right. your business or your organization. It's the facts about your customers. It's the facts about your suppliers. It's the facts about all the sales trends, all the product development trends in your business. It's the facts about your employees. And if you don't have access to the facts, especially when things are really turning now um, into a, a real economic crisis, you're left bare. Um, and, you know, when everything's going up and to the right, everybody, almost everybody looks like a genius. Um, and now we're going through a period and beginning a period where only the fittest will survive and the fittest will have the biggest brains and the collective brain of an organization is frankly how well they know their data, the facts about their business and how well their people have access to those um, throughout the organization. So I think it'll be a, a period of thriving for data.world. Um, and we're going to do our best to help our customers with that. And as a B Corp, we give our platform away for free if okay. people are using it for open data. We, we make yes. money, you know, in private use cases. Um, and there are now almost 1.7 million people in that community collaborating on climate change, cancer, poverty, nutrition. Right. We're going to see a massive uptick in community adoption during this time because it'll help people collaborate for free on things, you know, economic related as well as really um, all types of things. You know, the Uvalde tragedy that's happened this week yes. really hit home for us at data.world. Um, and we're going to put out a um, definitive open data collection about um, mental health and about the increasing amount of these tragedies, et cetera, so that hopefully lawmakers can do something besides send thoughts and prayers and actually you know, strike a balance with um, common sense 
gun reform, um, as well as, you know, hopefully helping on the mental health side, because this is a really sad week for our nation yet yes. again on that front. And any more data that help us in the mental health space, Brett, I'm, it is something that takes the entire village of the globe entering information and, and normalizing the willingness to talk about it. So, so thank Absolutely. you for your leadership there. Absolutely. Um, and, and the other thing I just heard you say to reinforce is when, when times are good, decision-making based on instinct is unlikely to reveal a big problem. When times are turbulent, we need data-driven decisions or at least data-informed decisions. And so- um, That's exactly right. I, exactly I think you're right. exactly right. Yeah. The hunger for, I, my decisions feel tougher today than they did six months ago. The, yeah, the yeah, impact it'll be tough. of those decisions requires better foresight. Yeah, even though you're taxpayer supported as a public right. university, you'll still feel the pain of this. Oh, uh, sure. And 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 the way you'll feel the pain is that everybody will be reading about it. Everybody's watching their stock portfolios. Everybody's watching their real estate, et cetera. And they're going to see things really drop. And they've already seen things drop and it's going to create an intensity at UT too, to say, do you really need to hire that person? Do you really need to spend this budget? Um, and frankly, the silver lining on this is that these periods are ones where great leaders and great cultures are really formed because mm -hmm. it does create an intense level of focus on collaboration which is Walter Isaacson said when he retired from the Aspen Institute, he said, out of all of these books I've written on Steve Jobs and Benjamin Franklin, Leonardo da Vinci and Michael Dell and the innovators and on and on and on, I've learned that what these leaders really have in common and what humanity really um, has to thrive is that human beings and leaders, great leaders are really good at collaborating. Yes. They're really good at working together. And yes. that's, that's what our platform's all about. I mean, you know, some of the greatest winners during this pandemic have been Zoom and, you know, we're on Zoom right now and platforms like Slack that allow right. you to right. collaborate. And Data.World is in that same genre of collaboration tools. Well, I think you've met our, your fellow alum CFO of Zoom, Kelly Steckelberg, but yeah, that was a remarkable growth in that platform over the it's last few years. Just unbelievable. Amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. My, my well, hat is off to Let's up to 40,000 feet and talk qualitatively. Uh, how do tough times impact cult company culture, Brett? Because as you alluded, you've been through some up and downs and what leadership qualities does it take? You mentioned collaboration. Do you have others you want to share? Yeah, I mean, collaboration is a huge one. Um, from a leadership perspective, you have to realize that times like these are ones where everybody's looking to you to provide a sense of stability. And it is helpful that I've been through these periods because I can tell them stories about how mm -hmm. my prior companies working with great teams there thrived during these periods, um, although it was more trying. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, you know, very focusing because frankly, you know, people start reading and hearing from their friends about layoffs. Layoffs are really ticking up in tech, hiring freezes, and what I talked about yesterday at our all hands with relation to this, we have a quarterly all hands where everybody flies in for that um, in our office is I talked about like, don't take this period of time for granted. Like we're truly fortunate to have each other, right? Um, to be on the right part of the trend in terms of what people are adopting with, yep. uh, with, with our business and, and what our product does. And the more we pull together and help each other 
and strive to help our customers navigate this period, the more, frankly, legendary all of you will become. I mean, the, by legendary, what I mean by that is the stat I'm personally most proud of during the Bizarre Voice years is there's now been over 70 companies started by former Bizarre Voice people, which really creates ripple effects right. in capitalism. Mm -hmm. And ripple effects throughout all types of nonprofits um, because those people give back ripple mm -hmm. effects that drive the economy. I mean, the restaurants right. they eat at, everything else. So, you know, the schools they decide to attend, I was just on with, uh, with a former Bizarre Voice person who's now considering getting their MBA, for example, um, and I really encourage them to do so. So these periods are, um, you know, really periods that you can choose to kind of wallow in the negativity of all and, and doom scroll, or you can choose to get a shovel and start building. And I'm in the get a shovel and start building business and, you know, data.world and Bizarre Voice and Core Metrics were frankly in the picks and shovels businesses. If you think about during the gold rush, it was yeah. the people that were selling the picks and shovels that really made the most money. Um, but the people that did strike gold, they made more money than the picks and shovels people. But obviously, that was really rare. That's <laughs> so. right. Well, I'm going to shift to a, a topic that you view with high positivity. Uh, you're known for having written an open letter to the tech industry about the, the importance and the benefits of diversity and equity and inclusion efforts. And it, you have packaged it as chapter 23 in the entrepreneur's essentials. Yes. But I want you to talk a little bit about the, the crucial reasons and benefits and how that has strengthened data.world and your prior companies. You bet. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have the book here and I know sure, you've been book. reading it, um, <laughs> you know, Lil. Um, and I made it actually the concluding chapter of my book. Um, and by the way, all the proceeds from this book, I don't make a dime. They're all going to the Kendra Scott Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute at UT Austin, which really benefits female entrepreneurs. And as it turns out, primarily females of color um, are, are the ones raising their hands and, and have, have a lot of needs for the mentorship and everything else. And I made it the concluding chapter because the third section of my book, there's three sections, there's founding, there's building, and there's helping. And the helping section is one where I really reflect on the responsibility an entrepreneur has to pay back to society. Mm. And in the wake of George Floyd, you know, I really started to think about my responsibilities and I've been very educated. There's been a lot of people that have invested in me um, on the history of our country. And I, I wanna be clear, I think we live in the greatest country in the history of the world. And I love capitalism. And I love the fact that we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, defeated the biggest empire the world had ever known. And that that entrepreneurial DNA is a part of us as Americans because of our forefathers in this country. Um, but obviously, you know, there, there's the historical inequities that also have been present. Um, and that's just part of our history. You know, there's, there's no denying that that's part of our history. Yes, we're not responsible for, for what our forefathers did on the negative front. Um, but we do benefit from what they did on the positive front. And frankly, some of us benefit um, more because of, you know, our race. Um, on the economic front because of that historical inequity. So, you know, think about what we really love as Americans. We love the diversity of our architecture, our music and food and literature and universities and cities and all of the great things that make this melting pot that we call America really work. And a company has a choice where it can be very deliberate about trying to shape itself to be more American, be more of a melting pot. And if you do that, it'll actually make your company perform better and you'll have a heck of a lot more fun as a company because there, you'll have much more rich dialogues. If I just hired uh -huh. a bunch of white male tech guys, um, which I know 
you know, that's the majority of who I know um, because I am a white male tech guy. Yeah. Then it's not going to be nearly as dynamic. And I know that for a fact because this is my sixth company and, right. and I can see how dynamic it is. And we're 59% today, um, either female or people of color at data.world. And it's incredibly fun and thriving. Right. Um, so I make the case for that in that chapter. And then I set up, okay, now here's how you actually do it. And one of the points I make is that if you want to create a diverse company, you need to show up at diverse places. Like when I hear oh. CEOs say, I can't find enough female engineers, or I can't find enough, you know, black engineers or salespeople or whatnot. I ask them where they've been hanging out. And the reality is that you're a female. Um, and I love the fact that you're a female as our Dean, and you're going to get invited to a lot more female leadership events sure. than I'm going to be invited to. As a matter right. of fact, I don't think I've ever been invited to a female leadership event. Um, and so you're going to know more females. Like if I want to tap into female leaders, guess who I'm going to call? I'm going to, you're right. going to be on my list. Yep. Um, if I want to tap into black leaders, guess who I'm going to call? I'm going to call, you know, someone like Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett, who uh -huh. is the CEO of Houston Tillotson and yes. a very good friend of mine. Yes. Um, so, you know, that that's just the way that society is wired. It's not a discriminatory thing. It's actually a, a, a beautiful thing that, you know, I'm a Jewish American. I'm going to be invited to a lot more Jewish events. And, and it's mm -hmm. because, you know, we have our individual yeah. cliques and kind sure. of labels and everything else. And, 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 you know, we pull together to help each other. That's, that's the basis of collaboration. So I, I basically lay it out in a prescriptive way if people want to go on that journey with us. And I promise you, you'll have a better company if you do. But it's, it's a challenging subject to talk about because we're in yet another period of time where people are trying to wave this stuff off as wokeism and, you know, trying to create more polarizing language um, and, you know, cancel culture and whatnot. And the reality is that, um, you know, there are, there are some truths in those labels if you um, start to discriminate in a really oppressive way in the other direction. Um, but the, there, there is you know, a really important balance here to strike in the nation that will basically create a more just and equitable society, which is what MLK was talking about in the first place. Well, Brad, a, part of why I love being at UT Austin is I think the values and ethos around here is it, it channels optimism into our students. And I find the I can get the most buy-in for seats at the table when we're growing the size of the table. Mm -hmm. And I watch this in our students because entrepreneurship is the minor that we're just seeing a, a crazy growth rate in at UT Austin. It's hosted largely inside McCombs. Mm -hmm. We now have 800 students from across campus in our entrepreneurship minor. John Harkey just funded the Harkey Institute for Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Studies and then, as you mentioned, the Kendra Scott Welly, we support through McCombs a concentration in women's entrepreneurship in that minor. So I want to take that and then turn it to you to say our students, even in turbulent times, are hopeful that Austin's and its tech hub for innovation is robust in the medium term, and I want you to talk a little bit about how Austin, Texas and the state of Texas is growing its reputation as a draw for entrepreneurs. Well, this is the most exciting time in the history of Austin on that front. Um, I was born here in 1972. I just mm -hmm. turned 50 years old. And um, I can tell you that when I was born, UT was thriving, the music scene was thriving. I went to the Willie Nelson picnics, but it was a pretty boring city outside of that. Um, it was pretty small. It was the size of Anchorage, Alaska right now. It was around 170,000 people. There wasn't a lot going on. We didn't have a lot of great restaurants um, and, and whatnot. 
Um, but my parents were entrepreneurs from the time I was born, and I learned a lot growing up and working with them. And there was a level of humility in Austin that I think is still pretty present, like like the fact that people are really wired to help each other and and not um, be too boisterous, et cetera. Um, I, I love that spirit of, of Austin. Um, so I think that character is still largely intact. Um, from a VC perspective and a startup activity mm -hmm. perspective, um, there is now a wide diversity of VCs here, everybody from Next Coast Capital and you know, Live Oak Capital or Live Oak Venture Partners rather and Sil Silverton Partners and S3 and a number of others um, to private equity like Vista Equity and a number of others there. Um, so the, the, the level of capital available um, is kind of unprecedented right now in Austin's history. You've had people like Joe Lonsdale move here from right. 8BC. You've had people like Jim Breyer, who I know has gotten very involved in yes. UC Austin, move here um, with Breyer Capital. They invested a lot of money in data.world, and Jim has been a terrific mentor to me. Um, so you've had just a, a, a tremendous kind of windfall, like a tipping point really occur in Austin. I think what that means, even during a recessionary time, is that Austin will be fairly well insulated. Um, we'll probably see a pretty big drop in home prices. My sister, Brandy, is one of the top 50 realtors in Austin, and she's already seen that drop, but she doesn't think it'll drop below 2019 levels, but we'll see it drop pretty significantly. Um, but she's kind of on the front lines of seeing that data directly and experiencing it directly as one of Austin's best realtors. So, you know, there'll be, um, there'll be some tough, you know, times and, and people will have to do some belt tightening, but I actually think it'll be a really good period for people graduating from UT if they stay yeah. in Austin. Um, other parts of the country will be hit much harder, but yes. from a tech perspective, um, you know, and tech, tech also will become even more important during this time, but make sure you choose wisely, um, students, when you graduate, because you really need to almost forecast the trends of that business. There, there will be surprises. There will be a lot of unicorns that go out of business during this time. Um, and it'll be shocking to people. I mean, it was uh, shocking, you know, this uh, earlier this week when Snap lost, you know, around 40% of its value. Right. It's kind of signaled that the advertising market online is, is cratering. Um, so there's going to be some, uh, it, Snap's not going to go out of business, but there's going to be some really system, systemic shocks that surprise people. Um, and you have to be a little bit of kind of like a futurist. <laughs> to forecast where you should spend your time. Um, I do think data is going to be very resilient and thrive during this time. Yes. Um, but, you know, there, there's other opinions that I have on that front. Software as a service businesses are in particular really good during these times because they're very predictable and stable from a recurring revenue perspective. Brett, when we were talking earlier this week, I don't want to misquote your statistic, but it was about the number of businesses that formed during COVID mm -hmm. because people were either forced out or voluntarily left employment right. and started their own thing. Is, is that something you could share about for a minute before we go to some pre-submitted questions? Yeah, and as my good friend, uh, Chris Himes, the CEO of Indeed says, um, it. It's not really the great resignation, it's the great realization. Um, and the great realization is that the pandemic forced people to take a real serious look at their lives and say, am I living the life I wanted to? Am I really in a job that I absolutely love? And there were more businesses started during the pandemic as entrepreneurs than have ever been started um, in the history of the United States. Think about that. In 2020, there were 4.4 million new businesses started. We're investors. My wife and I have a family office called Hurt Family Investments. We're investors in companies like Everly Well, um, Zen Business. Zen Business um, has absolutely thrived during this period because of all that new business formation. They're a competitor to LegalZoom and they do a lot more than LegalZoom. And, um, 
this period of economic turmoil that now we're going to go through, right. um, you know, after the malaise of the pandemic, it feels a little bit unfair to go through yet another turbulent period, but that is what it is. This period is one where it will create a lot of great entrepreneurs. During downturns, those are typically when the best businesses are founded. And, um, and the reason why is that only the best businesses will get funded. Ah. Uh, because VCs, you know, as Bill Gurley said recently, and I, I think he said this at UT, but I certainly heard him say this on a podcast. I know he spoke yeah. recently at UT is that the VC industry is shaped like a sawtooth where it's risk on and a kind of a hyperbolic up and to the right, um, you know, frenzy um, of deployment of capital and returns. And then it's a sawtooth in that it just goes completely crash um, and becomes risk off. And we're in a risk off period right now for the VC industry, especially in the growth VC industry, where those okay. unicorn valuations were being printed, there were companies that had 20 million of ARR, um, annual recurring revenue, which got well over a billion dollar valuation. And um, there's gonna be some surprises in terms of businesses that go out of business that people thought were really strong. Um, but, you know, again, pick well, and, and, uh, and, and, and I will say that you know, this is actually a good time to found a business. It's just your challenge is going to be finding capital. Um, so what does that do to you as an entrepreneur? It forces you to bootstrap it more. Right. Um, right. A, great, a great book. Part of the reason that I also gave my book away for free online to entrepreneurs that couldn't afford it. You can get the whole thing for free at the entrepreneursessentials.com. I hope you buy it in print, though, to benefit the Kendra Scott um, Women's you know, Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute at UT Austin. But you know, a huge reason I gave it away for free online is because one of the first books I read as an entrepreneur was Seth Godin's The Bootstrappers Bible. And right. Seth is one of the best business authors out there. And he gave it away for free online. Um, it was his first book. Um, and he did that because he's like, look, you know, this is, a, this is a book about bootstrapping and you might not be able to afford to pay for the print book. So here it is. Um, well, and, and you I talked my in book your book, Brett, about the bootstrapping. You may not grow as big or be as rich, but you get to keep being king of the enterprise. And so it really is a choice based on why did you go into business to begin with? Yeah, you're channeling my book, Lil. You're, I you're, am. You're, you're I've well read almost it. Um, all. Yes, it's a great I love book. it. Yeah, so, so I mean, <laughs> that, is, that is very true. There's a chapter about should you bootstrap or VC, right. this type of period for an entrepreneur is one where people do more bootstrapping than they used to okay. during this period. But if they find a really high velocity working business model, they'd be wise. In my opinion, this is just me, because um, I bootstrapped and I VC, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, kind of fueled my businesses. Um, if they find a really working high velocity business model, they should then raise VC capital. Yes. Um, so this is a period where it'll force you to really focus on revenue early, which is frankly healthy for the business. And then, you know, if you got a tiger by the tail, you know, go for it, right? Well, let's talk about downside sorts of things. Uh, we talked about positive qualities that are important to entrepreneurs. Um, can you caution us against qualities, thoughts, attitudes that would be toxic for an entrepreneurial mindset? What do, what biggest, do you need defenses against? Sure. The biggest one during a period like this is just being too fearful um, and letting that fear paralyze you. There's uh, chapter two of my book is on the paralyzing fear of starting a new business, but that applies to times like these where they can become very, very paralyzing. And action begets action, momentum begets momentum. And as a leader, people are looking at you to lead more during these periods, not go in a bunker and you right. know think it's not fair. You know, we've just been through the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. Take care of your mental health. Um, Take care of yourself too and take, take the time to reflect during these periods. Chapter 14 in my book is 
on the qualities of that get developed as you go from founder to CEO. And one of the lessons in there is that you need to take care of yourself because you'll build a better business that way. And you'll have a better family if you have a family and you'll certainly have better friends if, if, if you don't um, during that period of time, because you'll, you'll be someone who is taking the time to let the lessons you've learned bake and kind of oh. iterate on them. And I like to write, you know, that's, that's part of the way I iterate on it. Um, you know, a lot of people diary and, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I love, I love that process because it forces me to reflect. Um, so it's, it's, it, you know, it's mainly driven around fear and then, you know, be empathetic. Um, there's going to be a lot of economic pain out there and uh, especially if you're a CEO and you're in a great financial position, like, you know, my wife and I are, um, you really need to be empathetic. I mean, part of what keeps us grounded is that we weren't born into it. I had a thousand dollars and she had $2,000 when right. we got married. And I met her at UT Austin as a freshman and convinced her to marry me by her senior year. And, um, you know, I, I honestly joked with people that I'd married the older, wealthier woman because she had a thousand dollars more than me um, and is six months older than me. And uh, and, you know, we've really built this as a as a as a partnership um, during this during this period of time. Um, so it helps to go through these types of periods with a real partner. Um, but, you know, that 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 level of kind of where we started financially keeps us grounded. You know, I feel like super lucky to be in the position right. I'm in. Right. I don't take it for granted. Um, I love seeing people that I work with or I invest in make a lot of money and realize their dreams. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic feeling when that happens because I know that they're good people and I know that they'll do good things with that capital, both for their families and for the communities that they that they uh, that they care about. So you know, it's uh, that you, you have to practice empathy. And I've seen people in times like these before kind of become a little bit more jerky, um, frankly, because and part of that is that they're scared as a leader. A lot of times, sure. when a leader is acting like a jerk, it's because they themselves are insecure and are afraid. And if they're feeling that way, it's gonna translate to the whole company. What can CEOs do that are feeling insecure? Hire a CEO coach. I've had the same right. CEO coach since 2008. His name is Kirk Dando. Um, tune into his podcast, the For You Leaders podcast. It's fantastic. Um, talk about a real mensch, a real, you know, the real deal. I mean, he's built a company to over a billion in revenue. And, uh, and I love working with him. You know, he helps me stay grounded too. Well, and it's part of that theme you have in the book about having a kitchen cabinet and people to talk to and asking for help. Absolutely. And that gives you people to be honest with about the anxiety or the uncertainty so that you can show up as your not your fake more confident self, but in fact, right. by having that support, you are more confident in the workplace. Yeah. Um, you talked about the reflection time that's useful. Uh, what, what lessons do you have about meditation or mindfulness practices, especially given how quick the life of an entrepreneur is spinning that it seems like that pivot is useful during the day or the week? Yeah, well, a lot of people think I'm a meditator. I'm actually not, but I do practice um, an Indian philosophy called Vedanta, which is about strengthening your intellect to basically manage your brain. And what I mean by that, the brain ungoverned is like a child. It can jump between fears about the future, worries about the past, you know, mm -hmm. states of greed and lust. You think about some of the leaders that we put on pedestals and how sometimes they fall. Um, and it's because they're not governing their mind during really critical periods, you know? And, mm -hmm. and um, so Vedanta helps me become a better leader. There's a guru that I've studied under named Swamiji Partha Sarathi. 
And he wrote a book called Governing Business and Relationships that I think okay. is one of the best business books ever written. Um, and the chapter in there on leadership is one that I think is the best chapter on leadership that I've ever read. Um, so I've, I've shared things about that on my blog, lucky7.io, okay. which I named in honor of my mom, who unfortunately passed away almost 10 years ago to this day. She passed away on May 17th, 10 years ago, and I miss her. Dearly, I dedicated my book to her yes. as well as my wife. Um, that's why I wanted to put it out on Mother's Day because um, without them, I just would not be who I am at all. They've invested so much in me. You know, I was I was an entrepreneur after I got married, only because my wife helped me so much with that. And if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't have started programming at seven, right? Um, and become who I've become. I feel really lucky, you know, that's why I could name it lucky seven, because I had her as a mom. And because I found my passion so early, that's so right. hard in life sometimes to find your passion. Well, gosh, Brett, we are running out of time. And I was going to give you before I wrap up any broad last takeaways you want to offer about your entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so you get a last word and then I get a last word. Well, I, I don't want to reiterate any of the points I've made. I think I've made the points I want to make on, on, on this, these economic times and, and on leadership. One of the things I do want to say is that um, it's amazing what UT Austin has become. Um, it really is. Right. And I got to walk in my grandfather's footsteps um, when I came back to serve as entrepreneur in residence um, in that academic year, 2013 to 2014, and got to spend so much time with, with people like Michael Dell and Cotter Cunningham and Josh Bear and really terrific you know, entrepreneurs. And during that time, I will tell you that I was absolutely inspired by how entrepreneurship really is thriving at the university. I mean, this was now, yes. you know, um, eight years ago. So I can only imagine like how it is now internally. Um, right. And it's so cool that Kendra Scott gave that gift and, yes. and, and really created that leadership center for women, you know, yes. that, are, that are starting companies. Um, we all need that help. I'm a product of many, many people that have believed in me, starting with my my mom and my wife, um, and have invested a lot in me. I stand on the shoulder of shoulders of many giants. There have been many people, male and female, that have invested their love and energy in me. And I try to honor them with this book. And um, I do hope people will buy it. It's written um, you know, from a deep place of, yes. of, of love. Um, I'm really trying to help people with it. I really feel like I've learned a thing or two and in starting um, six businesses now over the past 26 years and investing in 125 other businesses and as well as 40 VC funds. Um, so I'm, I'm trying my best to pay back and honor those that have right. really helped me. And a lot of the lessons in the book are frankly things I've learned from them. Well, thank you, Brett, for taking time to be with us today. And I appreciate your friendship and all you keep doing for McCombs and UT to keep us on the cutting edge of business education. So hook them horns. And yeah, hook them horns. Thank thanks you so much. I'm, I'm proudly donning my uh, UT yes. <laughs> Longhorns. Well, this is one of many. It's one of many, you know, just to be clear. Thank, thank um, you, Brett. Thank you so much. This is an honor. And thank you to the audience for joining.